Hello everybody, um, Kim here, and uh, I am doing a Bible study for Christian Life Fellowship. Uh, we typically try to do this live, which I tried to do last Tuesday night, because that's when we have the Bible studies, and my internet was really intermittent, and it just didn't work out very well. So we shut it down, um, and I've been meaning to get on here and at least create a video that I can upload so that way I know for sure that we're getting everything so we were talking about Lydia and the book of Acts um, we're gonna be in chapter 16 if you want to go ahead and, and look at that so it's Acts chapter 16 and we're talking about Lydia uh, we're just gonna read uh, her story and and just talk a little bit about her and do a study on her and uh, as we go through this, I'm going to explain a few things, uh, what I've learned, and just share some insights that I have about Lydia. Okay, so let us begin. Uh, we're in chapter 16. <coughs> we're going to start with, we'll start with verse 9. Um, what what the backdrop of this is that, that Paul um, had got Timothy and... I believe at this point he also has Silas with him and uh, the idea was that they wanted to go into Asia and preach and in chapter I'm sorry in verse 6 it said that the Holy Ghost forbid them to go to Asia um, and so uh, according to a vision that Paul had in chapter 9 they end up in Macedonia instead um, so let's start with chapter 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. So Paul has this vision, and obviously this is a man who is asking him to come over. Um, so Paul had a habit of whenever he went into a town he would go to the synagogue and preach and at the synagogue typically um, there would be people there that would hear the word of the Lord and um, get to meet the Messiah so that's probably what Paul was expecting especially um, since this guy appeared to him in a vision so I'm sure he was looking for this person uh, when he ends up going there. So he's going to have a little surprise. Um, verse 10. After he had seen the vision, immediately uh, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. Now you got to remember, this is Luke writing this, and he includes himself here. So it's very likely that he was also on this mission trip. Uh, verse 11. Therefore... Uh, loosing from Tros, we came with a straight course, and I love some of these names, <laughs> um, to Samothatria, and the next day to Nepalese. So, verse 12, and from there to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony and we were in there uh, we were in that city uh, abiding certain days now this is where it gets interesting so this is it this is in verse 13 this is what Paul typically did he went into the synagogues um, to be able to share the good news that the Messiah had come and you got to remember he had a vision of a man who was asking him to come help so verse 13 and on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted there thither. So they go there and it's not a man that they find but a, a group of women. Now there's a couple things historically that I want to stop and, and talk about. Um, where they're at right now, um, Philippi, it was a 
a very, uh, I would say, cultured city. Um, there were a lot of people traveling in and out of that city. Um, it was a main thoroughfare, and a lot of trading was going on. There were also, as a result of the various cultures there, there were also different religious sects. And the city had a rule about um, certain religious groups could meet and certain religious groups could not meet. So it's very likely that the women here who were studying from the Hebrew Bible um, were meeting outside of the city near the river because they may not have been accepted in, in that city. Um, the other reason that it was only women at this point, in order, and there was no synagogue. Um, like I said, Paul was, was going there. He was probably looking for a synagogue, heard that you know there was prayer outside the city and went. Is In order to have a synagogue, you had to have at least 10 men um, to be able to even have a service. So we don't find any men here. Um, it's all women. All right, so that's a little bit of the background to keep in mind. Now, remember, it was a man who, in, his, in the vision that Paul had, he saw a man um, say, would you please come and help us? And here he finds these women. So just keep that in mind. Uh, verse 14, and a certain woman named Lydia, this is who we're going to talk about, uh, Lydia, a seller of purple in the, of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, had heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto us the things which were spoken of Paul. Now we're going to stop at verse 14, and we're going to really talk about this, because we get a lot of good information in verse 14. And before I started this Bible study, I went in... And I did some studying about Lydia. And uh, there are scholars uh, who know a lot about his history and archaeology. And they have been able to suggest a lot of interesting uh, information about Lydia. So I kind of want to talk about that and bring that to light in this Bible study. All right, so first of all, we, we hear a certain woman named Lydia. It's interesting to note that back then, Lydia was not a name of a person. Um, no one really named their child Lydia, but it was the name of a city that was in the district of Thyatira. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, perhaps it was a region in the, the city Thyatira was in the region of Lydia. And it was near Turkey. I believe from what I remember, uh, Northwest Turkey, from what I remember. Uh, so one of the things that scholars have suggested is that Lydia at one time might have been a slave. Now that was not uncommon back then. Um, people often would uh, sell themselves into servitude to be able to pay a bill. They would serve their time and then they would become free. So perhaps because Lydia is not a common name, um, she may have taken the name on of the region where she had been a slave. And this kind of gives us a clue into who she is. Um, the other thing about Thyatira is we know that it was a major thoroughfare as well, a big city. Um, there were uh, different people of different cultures and there were different religions. So it's interesting to note that um, we are told that Lydia is a worship, worship god. Um, Lydia is a Gentile. She's not a Jew. Um, nor did she fully become a Jew because... Um, it would have uh, suggested here that she was Jewish rather than a woman who worshipped God. Um, it's, it's very important to note that there were Gentiles who did not um, become Jewish 
people um, by conversion, but rather they did worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, so they weren't fully converted Jews, but they were what uh, history refers to as God worshipers. Um, and it's saying here she worshiped God. So she was a God worshiper. She hadn't fully converted to Judaism. So here she is, and she's meeting with these women down here. And obviously she's hungering and desiring to hear more about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, so Paul comes and he speaks to her and these other ladies. And verse 14 said, um, uh, especially of Lydia, that she, she heard them. Um, and her heart, the Lord had opened her heart. Now that's very important. No one cometh unto the Father unless the Spirit draw him. And so many times, you know, we try to talk to people about Jesus and they just can't hear us. Um, so when we get in those situations, the best thing to do is to pray that the Spirit of God would draw them. Because that's the only way, the only way that they're going to come. Um, but God had prepared her heart and um, she listened to the things that Paul had spoken to her. In fact, she listened to them and she understood them. And she accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior and her Messiah. In chapter 15, it says, And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So, not only did she accept the Lord, um, but her household was also uh, baptized with her. Now, this was not an uncommon um, occurrence to happen back in those days. If the leader of the household or the um, leader of the village or the city uh, were to be converted, then their whole um, domain, I'll say, would also be converted. It was not unusual. Um, there, you know, were missionaries that would go to whole villages, and if the leader of the village believed, then the whole village would get converted to Christianity. So that was pretty common, um, you know, that when she was baptized, so so was her whole, whole household. You know, it kind of gives us some, a hope to hang on to because... Um, you know, the Bible says, as far as me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. That's in the Old Testament. And the New Testament teaches us that me and my house shall be saved. So that's something that, you know, I would pray um, with my husband. Um, I, I, many of you know my story, but I'll share it for those that don't. Um, my husband... Um, passed away in 2016 of cancer and we'd been married almost 30 years uh, we were together about four years before we got married so we've been together a long time um, I was raised um, you know to believe in God and believe in Jesus and I got baptized when I was in fourth grade and I went to church all the way up till I was in 12th grade and then you know you you kind of get away and I moved out when I was 18 and I had an apartment with my friends and we were going to church for a little while and I ended up kind of getting away from that so you know like the whole time Dave and I were together I wasn't always going to church but after the kids were born um, it was time you know there you have to you have to come to a point in your life where you know that you have to raise your kids and the fear of the Lord, you know, that's what the Bible says to do, is uh, teach, teach them up the way they ought to go and they don't depart from it. So I got back into church and there was a, a, a transition for me when it was not so much about the kids anymore, but about my relationship with God, you know. Um, I don't want to go into a big long story, but let's just say, you know, like the song says, He touched me. And um, 
So from that point forward, you know, I had been praying for my husband to get saved. Now his background was that, you know, his, his mom and dad were Jewish, but they didn't raise him that way. He knew nothing. When I say nothing, I'm talking nothing about the Jewish religion. They never took him to synagogue. They never celebrated the Jewish holidays. In fact, they would celebrate Christmas and Easter. So as far as us being a couple, that wasn't an issue, you know, because we always had Christmas. We always had Easter. Um, I'm not even sure Dave didn't even know he wasn't supposed to believe in Jesus, you know, or the New Testament. Um, we would talk occasionally about stuff like that, um, but not too often. And, you know, it's just one of those things. I just kept praying and praying and praying and praying and praying for him. I prayed for him for years. And he finally, 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 you know, decided it was time, you know. So God, God has him. I know where he's at, you know. I have no doubt whatsoever. That's the one thing about when Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that is your ticket to heaven, you know. You you don't have to worry about where you're going to be because God has you. And I know where Dave is, so I don't worry about him. You know, I'll see him again someday. But in reading this about Lydia, as I said before, there were uh, scholars who could read the text and and they know the culture they know the history and there were many scholars who believed that Lydia might have been a widow and when I read that I obviously connected with her and resonated with her and when you read this and I don't think I talked about this um, but in verse 14 it says that she was a seller of purple um, the color purple back then came from uh, a specific snail that is in the Mediterranean area and uh, it, these snails are very rare and the process to even make this dye is very expensive so people who were sellers of purple were also very wealthy and so I think about Lydia and I think about her position and, and if she was a widow um, in this day and age you know way back in antiquity and she had a business a very profitable business and it just kind of like makes me stop and really admire her because first of all I'm thinking this might have been her husband's business and you know when a tragedy happens in your life you could very easily fall apart. I'm sure she had her days. But Lydia kept it together. You know? She had a household. Doesn't say who's in her household, but I imagine there's probably children. I imagine that, you know, if, 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 and later we learn, you know, that she has a church in her house. We'll, we'll get to that, and it's in verse 40. But I imagine her house was big enough to hold a number of people. She probably had um, people working for her, you know, and she had to take care of these people. So she couldn't, she couldn't fall apart, you know. She couldn't. <sighs> yeah, a little emotional. So I really resonated with her um, at that point because I thought, wow, look how strong, look how strong she was. And this was a woman of antiquity, antiquity. You know, she's not a modern day woman. I mean, nowadays women go out and they get jobs and they have families and they pay the bills. You know, they bring home the bake, bake has that song go, you know, I can bring home the bacon and fry it up in a pan. <laughs> um, but, you know, back then women didn't do that. And she had to be incredibly strong. And I wonder what the Apostle Paul thought when he met her. You know? He probably thought, wow, she's a jewel. You know? Here's an incredible woman. Doing her thing. Doing what she has to do to survive. You know, she's a survivor. And I want to go to verse 40 because I think that this is amazing. It kind of 
um, kind of resonates with the kind of person that she was. Let's go to verse 40. Uh, again, we're in chapter 16, and we're going to go to verse 40. You know, Paul had some events. He, he did some stuff. He preached. He went to prison. He got out of prison. <laughs> and we come to verse 40, and it said, And they went out of the prison, and they entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Now, there's some NIV versions that said that when they get there, there were brothers and sisters. Okay? This is in Lydia's house, the house of Lydia. All right? She's got not only just women anymore, but she's got men there. She didn't know Paul was coming, you know. <laughs> she's having church. Praise God. She's having church. And the church grew. You know? It wasn't just women anymore. You know, she had this beautiful home. And she opened up her home. And she invited those who would come and hear the gospel message. And what a wonderful, beautiful thing that she did. So I just want to encourage everybody out there. Um, the widows, the widowers, sometimes you can be married and be a spiritual widow. You know, I talked about that a little bit, or alluded to it. You know, I went to church, I took the kids to church, I was faithful and going to church every Sunday. I taught Sunday school. I did Bible study lessons. I went into the prisons and preached. I went into nursing homes and preached. And I did this without my husband. You know, I was a spiritual widow. And I've talked to a lot of women who went through something similar. And they said to me, you know, I didn't do any of that. And I just quit going to church altogether because he wouldn't come with me. I just want to encourage you to keep serving the Lord and just keep your eyes on Jesus. You know, he can be a husband to you. Jesus can be a husband to you. Um, he's faithful and he's true. And the word truly does tell us that as far as me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. And as far as me and my house, we shall be saved. You know, I just want you all to hang on to those words. Lydia is an incredible woman. And, uh, you know, the Bible says to, to give honor to those who shall be honored. And I truly, truly believe that this is an honorable woman. Uh, in case you're wondering, the church of Thyatira is mentioned in the book of Revelation. And a lot of people wonder if Lydia didn't go back to the city of Thyatira and bring the gospel. I imagine that she did. Um, and they heard about Jesus. And somebody there started a church. You know. Now granted, you know, a number of years later, <laughs> they needed a little bit of improving upon. And that's why we read in the book of Revelation that the Lord, you know, uh, reproves them. But, uh, you know, they, they knew who he was. They knew who he was. So, we all have a little thing we have to straighten out sometimes, right? Amen. All right. Well, let us pray. Mighty God, we thank you for this opportunity to learn about your word. And um, thank you. Thank you, God, so much for showing us the people of God in your word and encouraging us uh, by learning their story and uh, bringing us victory in Christ Jesus. God bless you all. Amen.